I want to thank you for tuning in to this worship service. Thank you so much for taking the time to dig into God's word with us. Here at Highview, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. And we'd love to invite you to come out to one of our services at one of our campuses. But we'd also love to, for you to check out Highview at highview.org. May you be blessed by our Lord as you dig into his word to know and follow Jesus. Church family, please grab your Bible, turn it back to the Gospel of John. You know where we are as we're working through this Gospel, and we find ourselves today in John chapter 4, which is likely for many in the room a greatly loved moment of Jesus' ministry with Jesus and the woman of Samaria, Jesus and the woman at the well. It's one thing for us to talk broadly about the truth and statement, Jesus Christ died for sinners. That's everything. It's everything, that, that truth, that reality. But it becomes even deeper and more emotional, provoking even more of a response, a response of worship, when we realize how individually he affects us and he seeks us. Even as we look at this moment with Jesus and this woman, his intentionality, his compassion, and his precision of care for a single sinner. And that we reminded ourselves the way he sought us individually. He sought us out and we see his heart when there are a hundred sheep and there is one astray, he comes running to rescue. We've even heard it in these stories of individual testimony about Christ and how he's brought change today. We need to leave with a worship of the son of man who came to seek and save the lost, but we need to take his heart as well that we might bring his gospel forward to individuals around us who need to know and follow Jesus. Would you stand with me? Let's just read this moment in Jesus' ministry. We'll start in chapter four, verses one through 15. We'll go through verse 30 in total today. Scripture says, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman asked him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you because you orchestrated this moment. Lord, you orchestrate every moment. There is not a millisecond outside of your sovereignty and your seeking of sinners. Father, thank you for your son. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for stepping into our mess and extending to us grace. And I pray it, Jesus, in your name, amen. You may be seated. Today, we wanna look in John 4 to the heart of Jesus for a single sinner. Now, he saved 
a bunch, okay? And there are a bunch in this room, right? And he will continue to save until he returns. But we need to see his heart for a single sinner. And as we look at this text, I want us to be drawn to a worship from, of him in, in two angles. One is the angle of what he has done for us that we would again be filled with a gratitude for Jesus who has sought us out, died for us, been raised for us, but also that we would worship him through an emulation of him, an emulation of his evangelistic approach of this woman and how we can learn from him and be conformed to him in that regard. Five points if you're taking notes as we walk through this text that we wanna see about Jesus. First, his sovereign timing. Second, his compassionate intentionality. Third, his promise of life. Fourth, his confrontation of sin and unbelief. And fifth and finally, his invitation to respond. If you don't get it written all down at first, we'll bring it up again point by point. First point, Jesus's sovereign timing. Look at verse one. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, and there's this note, although Jesus himself did not baptize, they administered it on his behalf, right? But only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. There's a kind of perception at this moment, if you were here last week, of competition between John the Baptist and Jesus's ministries. Of course, they weren't competing. That wasn't the point. And John even corrected that. He was pointing people to Jesus. He wanted to lose influence so that everyone would go to the Messiah. That was the point. And I, it would seem that Jesus wanting to move people away from this kind of thought about what's going on, but also with it, he's not seeking at this moment to accelerate his crucifixion. He's hearing that the Pharisees know that his ministry is exploding. And if he continues working in this way in Jerusalem, they're gonna kill him. And we already know from John chapter two, and we're all at the start of the gospel basically right now, his hour, as the scripture said, his hour has not yet come. It's not time yet for him to die. So it seemed that he's withdrawing to Galilee to let things settle a little bit. Because why? He's in submission to the will of the Father, the Father's timing. And this timing is not just about the overarching things of his ministry and an infinite number of purposes that we can never fully understand, but it's also about the timing of a woman that he has to meet. In verse four, we're told a note he had to pass through Samaria. Now, this is a geographical note that is just, hey, he had to go that way. If you're looking at Judea on a map in Galilee, the shortest route geographically, a matter of reality is you have to go through Samaria. But I believe there's more here than just a geographical statement being made. That's why John includes it. He had to pass through Samaria. And that word here in the Greek, when it's used in John, is used in some very unique context. It's used in context of what we might call divine requirement. In John 3, it's the word, you must be born again. You have to. It's out of necessity. John 12, the Son of Man must be lifted up. I have to. It's necessary, Jesus said, that I'm doing the works of the Father. He had to go through Samaria. Why? because it was the will of the Father that he meet a very particular, again, woman. Probably a lot other things than that, but we definitely know that from the text. And we're told these more, more details. Verse five, he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied, we see Jesus' humanity here on display, the God man, he is tired as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, that's noon. What we'd understand would probably be around 12 p.m. We're given all of these very normal details that honestly we can really, we can sympathize with, we can understand because we walk through normal details of our life every single day. But this moment is anything but normal. It's no accident that he's going to Galilee. It's no accident he's passing through Samaria. It's not just by chance that he gets tired at this very moment and needs to sit at this very well in Sychar at this very time. We already know Jesus is omniscient. We saw that with Nathaniel and saw it in John 2 as well. And it's crazy to think that Jesus has been coming for this woman days prior to this even happening. Do we understand that before the foundation of the world, 
he set up this appointment where he would find her, that he would seek her out. And when we begin to understand, when Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, that involves chronological progression of history. Every moment is meaningful in the life of a believer. When you get thirsty and you have to go get the polar pop, the 44 ounce, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's not an accident. When you have to go downtown to run an errand, you have to wait in line for something. When you're waiting for your child at that sporting event or for them to get out of school and you're standing next to those other parents, those are not accidental moments. And when you begin to view them through the lens of our Lord's authority, what you begin to recognize is that in every single moment, the Lord is orchestrating things to bring the salvation of sinners. Every single moment becomes meaningful. There are no normal moments. They're all upheld by his authority. And so we ask, what is he doing? Doesn't that get you excited? Like what's gonna happen at lunch today? It can get wild, but are we sensitive? But it's not just about timing. It's about what he's about to do. He's gonna engage her. Second point, if you're taking notes, we see Jesus's compassionate intentionality, his compassionate intentionality. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Okay, for anyone reading in the first century in that, that time period, especially dude, this was a loaded sentence all at once. I mean, you're thinking what in the world is about to happen? As you can see later in John's note, Jews and Samaritans don't get along. We'll talk about that. But she came to draw water. And remember, it's noon. Many of you might be familiar with this. It's likely that she's coming at noon because she doesn't wanna be seen by anyone else because you don't draw water in the middle of the day at the hottest part of the day. We'll find out later after verse 15 that she has several things going on in her life that it would indicate she is ashamed of. She's trying to avoid people for sake of shame. But you know, it struck me this week, she's not any different than Nicodemus. She's going in the middle of the day not to be seen by anyone. Jesus came at night, so he couldn't be seen by anyone. It's amazing. She would seem to be full of shame in her mind at the bottom of the social ladder and he's at the top and they're no different. None of us are any different. We all have the same fears. We all have the same sin. We all have the same shame. We all have the same brokenness. Matter of fact, the more you think about it, look at who Jesus has pursued in John. Everybody. I mean, he's gone after working class fishermen. He's able to kick it with them. He's able to gain their respect. He's able to go to a wedding in a social environment with friends and families and be hospitable to a young couple. He's with Nicodemus, who's at the top, highly esteemed Pharisee, respected person. He goes toe to toe and basically tells him, you don't even know your Bible. And now he comes to the woman of Samaria who's full of shame that nobody wants to talk to, that nobody probably regularly engages. And he engages her. And the point is every single one of us, every single one of them needs Jesus the very same way. Let's not get in our minds that any of us are that impressive that Jesus is impressed with us, but let's not get in our minds either that any of us are so simple that he's repulsed and won't come for us. He comes for the heart. He says, give me a drink. Give me a drink. This isn't an order. He's not ordering her around. This is an act of kindness that he's talking to her. And she receives it as totally abnormal. And you can see it in her response. The disciples have gone away and the Samaritan woman responds. It's like, hold up, this doesn't make any sense. This is, you've crossed 14 cultural boundaries right now. How's it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? So there's a twofold thing going on. Number one, it was culturally viewed as crossing a boundary for a man in this situation to talk, even talk to a woman. But more than that, she's a Samaritan and Jews don't deal with Samaritans. I mean, they don't have any interactions. You can see John says that. And we need to know a little background why. For one, you go all the way back to about 931 BC, there was a split in Israel's kingdom. Under the rule of Rehoboam, the Northern tribes seceded from Judah. And eventually under an evil king named Omri, they established their own capital, the capital of Samaria. Well, they did that. And then later in 722 BC, a little, you know, about 200 years after that, Assyria came in and brought them into exile. And what happened with the Northern tribes were brought into exile, over time, they began to intermarry with pagans. 
They begin to enter into marriage relationships and have children with people who did not believe in Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so there was this mixing of peoples until you know the third or fourth century BC, you had this group of people, an offshoot of Judaism, a heretical sect of Judaism developed called the Samaritans. So you see why the Jews didn't, Get along. I mean, they viewed them as traitors and the Samaritans established a different place of worship, which they believed to be Mount Gerizim rather than Jerusalem. And you'll see her talk about that later. And they rejected all the Hebrew scripture, all the Old Testament, except the first five books of the Pentateuch. So they had rejected God's revelation. For that reason, there was this despising of the Jews, but Jesus goes straight through all that. Aren't there a million reasons for us to not talk to somebody? to not care for somebody, yet he came for us. What if he judged according to our circumstance and our mess and he didn't bring to us the gospel, but yet he, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. It's the sick who need a physician. Jesus comes for us. And there's something here in the character of Christ, again, to not just worship him for, but emulate. He's outgoing. She is a stranger, at least, to him, in a sense, they've never met. He knows her well. He's a stranger to her, but not for long. How often in social settings are we around strangers and are we on our phones because we don't want to talk to anybody? Are we just act oblivious? Just don't make eye contact. Then maybe I won't have to say anything to them. Just elevator. You're like, go, 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 you know. But this is not the character of Christ. I would put before you that I don't care what personality test you have taken, if you're being conformed to the image of Christ, you're gonna become more outgoing. Because he initiates with us, he came for us. We love because he loved us and people are gonna love when we show love to them, his love to them. We not only are outgoing and engaging people, but we're willing in the same regard to engage people in a way where people don't know what category to put us in. That's what happens to her. Well, hold on. You are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, I'm a woman. What in the world are you doing talking to me? But there is a unique, let's just say what it is, holiness to him that is drawing her in. And may we, as we worship Christ and we're around people and as we're around strangers, engage with people in a way where we are holy and so distinct that people don't know what category to put us in. Why are they being so kind to me? Why are they being generous to me? Why did they help me with that? I cannot believe they remembered that detail that I shared with them. We have to learn to be others focused as we serve Christ, especially in conversation, that people would be drawn in because of our kindness, our love toward him. You see a compassion of Jesus, intentionality with her, but for what purpose? He's gonna offer her life. It's not just friendly for friendly's sake. Yes, he's doing it because he, he loves her, but he wants to give her something. Third point, if you're taking notes, we see Jesus' promise of life. Look at verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Okay, so far we've been talking about really normal stuff. Let's get the bucket. Hey, give me a drink. I'm thirsty. I'm tired. I need some water. But Jesus just flipped the whole script. I mean, I don't even know she knows what's going on now. We're talking about living water. We're talking about something else. We might say that this is kind of conversational bridge. Many of you probably heard that language before. I don't know where, where it's come from, but a conversational bridge in the sense of he's taken their surface level conversation about getting water and the temporal things of life and he's just taken it to a completely different level. He's addressing some eternal things now. He's addressing something that matters. We have to talk to people about things that matter. And I'm, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will give you really weird opportunities. If we'll be sensitive, the Lord just gives these gifts. And I'm gonna tell you about one. I don't know if it's if anything ever is gonna happen like this again, okay? Many years ago, I was in my old gym in Middletown and this group of five guys comes in, not the restaurant, just five guys. <laughs> five guys come in and they all have buckets of water, okay? Not buckets of water, bags, bags of water. 
not bottles, mind you, not Stanley thermoses, which are in vogue, bags, okay? Now that doesn't seem very conducive where there's iron, you know what I'm saying? But they're carrying around their bags, they got their little handles and quite honestly, I'm really interested in this. And so I'm, I go and talk to this guy, I'm like, bro, what's with the bags? What's with the bags of water? And all of a sudden he just drops everything he's doing. Oh, no, listen, hold on. I just gotta tell you about this. He's like, listen, <clears throat> you have no idea how awesome this water is. Let me tell you about this. Begins the biggest sales presentation I've ever heard. I mean, and it was passionate, okay? Very passionate about this water. And he says, listen, me and my boys, like we all went in on this machine. It was like $5,000 and we all, bought, we all bought into this machine and now this water's being produced and we're selling it. It's amazing. You know, it's like the perfect pH and it's like ionized and stuff. Listen, some of y'all out here, you got your ionized water. You think you're the better than us because you don't drink Louisville tap. We know who you are. The rest of us peasants, we drink the tap. But they like, listen, it's ionized. Listen, I mean, he says, it's changed my life. And he goes on and on and on and on. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh man. Like if we don't go John four right now, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I didn't, I'm not, I can't make this stuff up. I mean, this wasn't my idea. I was just like, Lord, you are so good. All right. And so he gets done with this whole sales pitch. And I'm like, Hey, I was like, I'm really excited to hear about your water. I'm glad you're really excited about it. But I actually have some water myself that I think is better than yours. And he's like, what? I mean, he's offended at this point at me. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, well, I mean, do you have a machine? I was like, no. I was like, it doesn't really work like that. I was like, but listen, here's the crazy thing about this water. Not only has it changed my life, I said, when you drink it, you never get thirsty again. I mean, his jaw is just like, where is this water? And so, you know, I may or, not, may or may not have dragged this out a little longer than I'm telling this right now. But we get through this whole conversation. He's like, uh, he says, listen, I just wanna know where to buy this stuff. I'm like, that's the craziest thing, it's free. I was like, you don't even have to buy it. And he says, just tell me. Like you, I said, you gotta know just who to get it from. He's like, well, tell me who to get it from. I said, well, his name is Jesus Christ. And his face became as pale as a piece of paper. And we had one of the most amazing conversations ever. He didn't get saved. I don't know where he is today, but the Lord did that. I, like, I'm not doing anything. I just like the Lord just, he will give us opportunities to say, to say, hey, let me tell you about something that actually matters. Something that actually can change you. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God, He's bringing it to eternal matters. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you knew who I was, Jesus said, I wouldn't have started this conversation. You would have started this conversation. But that's the point. In a million moments of this same opportunity, if they were afforded to her, she would never know who he is. She would never ask him for this. That's why he started the conversation. That's why he said, give me a drink. Brothers and sisters, we need to stop waiting on people to ask us for a drink of something that they don't even know they're thirsty for. People are drinking the gravel of their sin. And unless we tell them they need Jesus, they're not going to know. Faith comes by hearing. If you knew the gift of God, who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. He would have given you living water. Jesus saying, I'm the gift. That's what he's saying. The one talking to you is the gift. That's him. Well, she misunderstands him, of course, because she's thinking on a temporal plane. The woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Like, what are you talking about? You don't have a bucket. Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. If she only knew, she's talking to the God of Jacob. Is he greater than Jacob? This is the Lord of Jacob. Jesus presses in, verse 13. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. What he's saying is, listen, the way you're living your life doesn't work. 
the way that you're pursuing your life and your goals and your purpose, it's going to leave you thirsty. It's going to leave you unsatisfied. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. We're not talking about H2O. I hope everybody realizes that at this point, right? We're talking about eternal life. You can never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up in eternal life. You know, I know in my life, even after Christ, a million times, I've tried to satisfy myself in things that don't work. I've tried to rest in ways that don't work. I've tried to find pleasure in ways that don't work, to fulfill desires in ways that leave me empty. Like even as a follower of Jesus, you have to be taught again that he's the living water. This is what's so heartbreaking. Jeremiah says it well in Jeremiah chapter two, as a prophet, God says, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. This is who Jesus is, right? Not only have we rejected him in sin, but we've hewn out cisterns for ourselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. I can just be willing to bet to say in a room this large, somebody in here, you're still trying to drink out of a broken cistern. You're still trying to find fulfillment in something besides Jesus and you are thirsty. And he says, come to me, I have living water. It's a picture of purification and cleansing. He can forgive you. He can transform you. He can change you. And it's not stagnant. It's a spring. If the Holy Spirit gets in you by Jesus, it's going to change everything. He's addressing her. I mean, all this hope. You're telling me I can have something that's going to satisfy me deeply like this in all of her brokenness. She says, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. She's curious, but interestingly, until any of us can have living water, something has to be dealt with. Jesus confronts her sin and unbelief. If you're taking notes, it's point four. We see a confrontation of sin and unbelief. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. She thinks that this was gonna work because he doesn't know her, but he does know her, right? He knows everything about her. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. If she wasn't feeling heavy already, she did now. Please don't miss this. Jesus never fails to address sin, ever. Go call your husband. He goes straight for the most vulnerable brokenness of her life, but not to condemn her. He wants to change her. He loves her to show her compassion. But he shows us there is no entrance into the kingdom of God. There is no receiving of living water if there is not first sin being addressed, confessed, and repented from. Sin has to be dealt with, and Jesus can do this. Why? Well, because he's the one that would pay for her sin. Jesus Christ died for sinners, but what you see in this text is Jesus Christ died for this woman. He died for her. He's addressing her sin because not long after in his ministry, he would pay for her sin. Please know today, I don't know what background you may come from. Jesus does not forgive or show mercy by overlooking. Jesus forgives because he went to the cross and he bore the penalty. He bore the price that was to be paid. He took the penalty aimed at her from the father and he stood between them, stood in the gap, paying her price a few years later. He died for her. And he's addressing her sin because he's the only one who has the authority to forgive it. He's the only one who has the authority to forgive any of us. And he wants to, he desires to, but the question is first, has your sin been confessed? Have you confessed your sin before the Lord? He knows. It doesn't matter if anybody else doesn't know, if you're hiding it from everyone. That's not gonna matter when you stand before God to be judged. He, He knows everything. If you confess your sin, the scripture says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin. He paid for it. 
He died for you. He bled for you. On the third day, he was raised from the dead so that by grace as a gift, you might receive a drink of that forgiveness of that living water if you would only believe. If you would only confess him as Lord. And notice that when he addresses sin, it's not generic. He addressed a specific sin. I think today there may be some in the room that your track record might even be similar to this woman's and you're struggling or you have shame. I think it's probably the case that there's someone in here and you are living with someone like this woman who is not your husband or you are living with someone who is not your wife and you need to know you can't remain there. He loves you too much for you to remain there. It's sin, it's rebellion. And please do not deceive yourself to think that if you remain in that living situation that you are forgiven of your sin. He who says, He has the light, but walks in the darkness is a liar and the truth is not in him. But Jesus invites you out. He invites you to be free. He invites to show you compassion and grace and mercy and to never bring up those things of the past again, to remember your sin no more, but you must receive him. And friends, we have not shared the gospel if we're not addressing sin. You can say all you want about hope, but if you don't address the reason why we need hope, we've not talked about anything. We need to be freed from a penalty and that penalty is death. That penalty is hell and Jesus is the only one that can pay it. If you listen to her response, she's taken aback. You can tell in verse 19, the woman said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet, (laughs) right? You weren't supposed to know that. You see, but this is what God does. He reveals the secrets of the heart. And you might say, well, you know what? When I'm sharing the gospel, I don't, I'm not omniscient. I don't know what's going on in someone's life. I could have never known that detail. You're right, but you don't have to. The Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit reveals the secrets of the heart and he, John 16, brings a conviction. It's what she's experiencing. Her sin has just been revealed before God and she understands it. She's experiencing conviction of sin, of righteousness and judgment that she would be drawn to him. And she takes the opportunity, either one, to change the subject or two, to say, wow, this guy knows what he's talking about. So I'm gonna ask him about, I don't know, the biggest uh, confrontational dispute between Jews and Samaritans that there is. Verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. So she's referring to Gerizim. Remember I said they denoted a different place of worship, the Samaritans. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So he's essentially challenging, Lord, tell me the truth about this. And look at what Jesus does. He doesn't just confront her sin. Don't miss this. He confronts false religion. He confronts her unbelief. And this part, oftentimes, I don't think gets focused on in the text. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Okay, what Jesus is going to do in the new covenant means that worship is taking place wherever his people are filled with his spirit. Amen? His people, right? But more than that, Jesus says, you must be focused on worshiping the father. It seems what he's communicating is you're focused on the wrong stuff. You're focused upon the places of religion and the rites of religion and the traditions and the customs of religion and the externals of religion, you need to be focused upon relationship with the Father. That's true worship. So one, he corrects her conception of worship, says it's about relationship. But then two, verse 23, he says this, or verse 22, you worship what you do not know. Okay, don't miss that. He just said, you don't know the truth. That's what he just said. You are worshiping, but you don't know what you're worshiping. You're worshiping wrongly. You worship what you do not know. We worship, now he's referring to the Jews, to what we know for salvation is from the Jews. He says, as to your question about who is Orthodox, it's not the Samaritans, it's the Jews. He says, you're, you're, you're wrong about that. You've rejected the scripture. He, she rejected all that Old Testament scripture, the Hebrew scripture. She rejected God's revelation. Therefore, she rejected the truth. Don't miss this. Jesus, in course of this dialogue, has shown her compassion and love, but he has said, the way you're living your life doesn't work. He's told her, you're living in sin. And now he said, all your family tradition, your religion, all your heritage that you've grown up in, you need to understand it's wrong. 
Are we willing to do that? For a person's soul? I know the greatest sin of our culture is telling somebody that they're wrong, but that's an imperative of the gospel is to, hey, graciously and kindly, we're not being rude. Hey, that's false. But he gives her the antidote. Look at this, verse 23. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I believe the spirit and the truth is the antidote to the two things he just confronted. She's not worshiping according to relationship. You must worship in the spirit. What does that mean? True worship is inward, moving outward when a person has been transformed by who God is to desire him and love him and walk with him in relationship with him. And you must worship in truth, which means what? Not according just to right relationship, but according to right revelation. Both those things must be done in tandem. Listen, I don't care how passionate you are about something or even something in Christianity, if it's not in this book, it's not worship. On the other hand, I don't care how right we are about something. If we're perfectly right and precise and we don't have a love for Jesus and a love for neighbor, it's not worship either. Both of those things have to be done in tandem. And notice it brings to a point of climax right here where finally it seems she's starting to get it. I would assert to you that I think she might even be fishing. She might even be wondering, who is it that I'm talking to right now? In verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. When he talks about worshiping in spirit truth, where does her mind immediately go? Relationship with the Messiah and the truth of what the Messiah is going to say. Spirit and truth. And what does Jesus say? But I who speak to you am he. Do we wanna worship in spirit and truth? It is all about our response to Jesus. Receiving living water, believing in him for the forgiveness of sin, being changed by him, and leaving everything behind. Look at this. Jesus invites her to respond in this when he tells her who he is. Final point, it says, the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar. Don't miss that. And went away into the town. And what's the first thing she does? She tells somebody else about who he is. Come and see. You remember that language? Come see a man who told me that I ever, all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. That note that she left her water jar is not a random note. It's telling us something about what happened in her heart. He said, if you drink that water, you're gonna remain thirsty. If you give what I, take what I give to you, you're never gonna be thirsty again. And she left the old life behind. I think it's time for somebody to leave the old life behind today, to believe in him, let him change you. You will never be thirsty again, but you must believe. And if you believe, show it by getting in that water. If you believe, show it, confess him as Lord. Man, let's be faithful ourselves to have the heart of Christ for even a single sinner. Would you pray with me? Jesus, you are so kind to us. You were so intentional with us. You sought us out. And I pray just right now in these moments, we would worship you, we would be grateful, we would love you, and we would be so changed, we would leave our own water buckets behind. And we would go say, look at one who can change your life also. Thank you, Jesus, in your name, amen.